Very good. Well, while those outlines are still coming out, let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to study your word, uh, to learn how to uh, understand it in the big picture, and also communicate it to others. We pray that you bless this uh, exercise that we're going to go through, uh, that it may assist us to be more effective in your call on our lives to, uh, to preach and to teach the good news of salvation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, folks, so this is a presentation called How to Get Through the New Testament in an Hour. Uh, this is based on uh, my book, New Testament Basics for Catholics, uh, which is available for sale in uh, the bookstore. Um, but this presentation can be used apart from the book. Um, and as we're going to see, uh, I think it's a helpful way of summarizing the big picture of the New Testament. Now, those of you that may have been through uh, Bible Basics for Catholics or seen me present how to get through the Bible in an hour uh, know that uh, for that exercise, I use a sequence of seven uh, icons of the seven different covenants throughout salvation history. And that gives you the storyline of salvation that you can sketch in. Now, the same approach does not work with the New Testament because the first four books of the New Testament tell the same story uh, in four different ways. Uh, The Gospels, right? So we can't simply have one storyline that covers uh, the New Testament. We have to use a different approach. And so What I like to do then is concentrate on four authors, all right? There are, in fact, eight authors of the New Testament, and there are 27 books of the New Testament. It is a whole world unto itself, smaller than the old, but still rather substantial. How can we, you know, cover 27 books and eight different authors over a period of about uh, 75 years? Uh, How do we get a picture of that? Well, If we concentrate just on the four main authors of uh, the New Testament, we get about 90% of the content in just four authors, and four is a nice small number. You know, they say even rabbits can uh, uh, count up to four, right? So, uh, So we humans should be able to do that even after a long day at work. Uh, So the four authors that we're going to cover, and we can sketch this in the first panel, on your uh, outline. Um, These are what I call the rock stars of the New Testament, Um, these four main authors. And our first one is going to be St. Matthew. So this is how we sketch in St. Matthew uh, in stick figure form. Okay, we're going to give him a money bag, of course, because he was not a taxi man, but a tax collector. Okay, common mistake that students make. All right, didn't drive a yellow cab. He collected taxes. And uh, in order to collect taxes, you had to be a good record keeper. So uh, ancient tradition that St. Matthew was a scribe. And so in his left hand there, we're going to uh, give him a quill uh, that reminds us that he was um, uh, a skilled in the art of writing. And uh, there's, a, there's an ancient um, uh, tradition in the church that it was because St. Matthew was skilled in record-keeping and, and uh, collecting taxes, etc., that he was the one designated among the twelve to write down our Lord's words. I mean, think about it. You have to, you have to capture Jesus' teaching for posterity. Who is equipped to do that? Fisherman, 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 accountant. Okay, you're the one, all right? Uh, that's going to get designated. So, Matthew was good with, uh, with keeping records. Uh, according to tradition, he wrote his gospel first in Hebrew, and then it was quickly translated into Greek, uh, the first of the New Testament writings. So this is St. Matthew. St. Matthew gives us one-eighth of the New Testament. One-eighth of the New Testament comes from his pen, pen excuse me, and of course uh, he was uh, uh, born and raised a Jew and uh, became a follower of Christ. So our second um, author, though, was not born and raised a Jew. We're talking about St. Luke, of course, and this is how we sketch in St. Luke. Looks a lot like St. Matthew. That's the influence of being around Jesus together for so long. 
And on St. Luke's head, we're going to put one of those little head mirrors that, uh, that doctors like to wear. And then uh, around his neck, a stethoscope. And this helps us to remember that St. Luke was... <coughs> oh gosh, this is going to be bad. Um, can somebody fetch me those little, that little packet of tissues there? Um, this helps us to remember that St. Luke was, as we recall, the beloved uh, physician. Thank you. Um, St. Luke was a Gentile. Um, there's different opinions. I'm convinced in my own mind that he was a proselyte to Judaism uh, prior to um, becoming a follower of Christ. Uh, and the reason I believe that is because his gospel is um, so full of allusions and uh, references to the Old Testament that it seems like he had really been in the Old Testament for quite some time. Now, in St. Luke's uh, right hand, excuse me, left hand, uh, we're going to draw him holding a picture. And then on that picture, we're going to put the image of a woman. This is the Blessed Mother. According to tradition, St. Luke um, painted a famous portrait of the Blessed Mother. Um, We're not 100% sure that that tradition is correct, but even if St. Luke did not paint her portrait with paint, he certainly painted her portrait with words, because St. Luke's Gospel gives us more information about the Blessed Mother than any of the others. In fact, all of the joyful mysteries come from Luke chapters 1 and 2, where we have the densest, densest descriptions of uh, the life of the Blessed Mother uh, of anywhere in Scripture. So this is St. Luke. St. Luke, as you know from this conference, gave us two books, the Gospel of Luke as well as the book of Acts. Together, Luke and Acts are the first and second longest books of the New Testament. Uh, they, they comprise about a quarter of the total, about 25% of the total uh, word count of the New Testament comes from St. Luke, this Gentile convert and physician. Because he was trained as a doctor, which is a high-class profession, you see that he had a great education. As Dr. Hahn mentioned last night, uh, he has the finest, most polished Greek prose of any author because he was really from the educated classes, unlike the others who were from the lower working classes in ancient society. All right, our next author is a close companion of Luke, or vice versa, And uh, you can guess who's coming. This, of course, has to be St. Paul. And so we're going to draw St. Paul, and his symbol is going to be a sword. The reason why St. Paul has a sword is for two reasons. First of all, he is the one who speaks of the Word of God as being the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians 6. So he's associated with that concept of wielding Uh, the Word of God as uh, the spiritual sword. Furthermore, he was executed with a sword. He was beheaded outside the walls of Rome, thus St. Paul outside the walls, that famous uh, basilica, one of the major basilicas of Rome. So uh, the sword represents St. Paul, and in his left hand, we're going to give him another symbol of his career, which is a letter, Uh, because, of course, St. Paul was the great letter writer, of the New Testament. Um, The traditional Pauline collection consists of 14 letters from Romans through Hebrews. There's doubt about Paul's authorship of Hebrews, although I would defend it for a variety of reasons, but we can't go into that. But traditionally, Hebrews is associated with St. Paul. Those letters of St. Paul, again, make up about a quarter of the New Testament, almost as much as Luke's writings when you add all of Paul's letters Together. Now we make ourselves a little space here, and uh, in the final section on our panel of the rock stars of the New Testament, we're going to sketch in here somebody who's shorter than the others. The reason we make him shorter is because he was younger, the youngest of the apostles, and that, of course, is St. John. How do we recall that, uh, that this is St. John? Well, uh, we're going to put in his left hand a uh, Eucharistic cup and host. This reminds us that St. John tells us the most about the Eucharist of any New Testament author because he is the one that delivers to us 
John chapter 6, uh, our Lord's bread of life discourse, which uh, as we recognize having been initiated into the sacraments, is really a sacramental discourse about the Eucharist. Um, not only that, so we put that in, uh, in St. John's uh, left hand. We're, in his right hand, we're going to make upraised in the traditional sign of blessing uh, with the fingers isolated that touch the Eucharist. That reminds us that according to uh, ancient church tradition, St. John functioned as a uh, bishop uh, celebrating the Eucharist for the early Christian community. And over St. John's head, we're going to put the descending Holy Spirit, this uh, icon of the Holy Spirit. It, this reminds us that St. John uh, teaches us the most about the Holy Spirit, again, of any New Testament author. That's because John chapters 13 through 17 are what we call the Last Supper Discourse. In particular, chapters 14 through 16 are all a discourse about the Spirit and its role in the Christian life. Those three chapters are the densest teaching on, on the Spirit in the Bible, and thus we read from that section of St. John, you might recall, during the Easter season, in the later, later Sundays of Easter, like Sundays 4, 5, and 6, uh, and 7, we read from uh, St. John's Last Supper discourse as we're preparing for Pentecost. Okay, so John, particularly Spirit and Eucharist. So these four are not uh, John, Paul, Ringo, and George, but they're Matthew, Luke, Paul, and John. These are the rock stars of the New Testament. John wrote five books, recall, his gospel, three letters, and the book of Revelation. Uh, his authorship of Revelation is debated, but uh, I, would, uh, I would affirm it. Uh, together, the Johannine writings, we call them, make up about 20% of the New Testament. So Matthew gives us an eighth, Luke a quarter, Paul a quarter, John a fifth. Add that all up. It's about 85 to 90% of the New Testament are from these four men. So when we're trying to get through the New Testament quickly, try to get the big picture of it, we can focus on these four and they're going to give us the main message. All right. So let's talk about the theme of the New Testament. You don't have to write this down in your papers. I didn't leave you a panel for it. But the theme is the kingdom, much like the book of Acts, okay? You see that from first to last in the New Testament. The first verse of the New Testament is this, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Folks, <clears throat> excuse me, son of David is a royal title. So right off the bat, uh, Jesus is identified with the royal line of David. And then Matthew launches into his royal genealogy, tra tracing his descent back to uh, David. Uh, almost the last verse of the New Testament is Revelation twenty two sixteen, where Jesus speaks, and uh, uh, before he disappears, as it were, from the, from the pages of the New Testament, one of the last things our Lord affirms is, I am the root and the offspring of David, okay? Calling to mind, again, his royal lineage. So from beginning to end, it's about Jesus, the royal son, the king, and the theme can really be taken as our Lord's preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, okay? In fact, that's what I use as the call and response to start every session of my New Testament class here at uh, Franciscan University. Usually taught in the spring, they file in on January 17th, it's freezing cold in Steubenville, it's uh, the ice planet Hoth outside, and uh, we all gather together and I say, okay, the theme of the New Testament is this, repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So I'm going to say, repent. You say that. Let's try it right now. Repent. Amen. Excellent. You'd make excellent students. You should all come here and uh, take, uh, take uh, a theology major with us. Okay, let's move on now. So repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, that is our theme. Let's move into the gospel of Matthew in the second panel that you have on uh, your sheets. And uh, the idea behind Matthew is basically that the kingdom has come. Matthew writes early on in, um, in the uh, development of the church, and uh, the major thing that he wants to emphasize is the arrival uh, of the kingdom. Others are going to take it further and develop the idea of the kingdom, but Matthew wants to emphasize Jesus has brought it. So from beginning to end, Jesus is the Davidic king in Matthew. Look at how the gospel begins. We saw this already, the son of David. The gospel ends with what we call the Great Commission. Jesus came and said to them, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Notice that it's not teaching them all that I've commanded you, but teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. That's very important. Just a digression here. The church's educational mission is not done until Catholics are putting it into action. Okay? Until we're living the gospel, okay, we have not been catechized. Right? Teaching to observe. Just a thought. But uh, previous verse, look, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is a claim to universal kingship. It's Christ the King, the last feast of the, of the church year, right? All authority in heaven and on earth. So at the beginning of the gospel, he's the royal son. At the end, he's been given kingly rule over the universe. So it's all about Jesus bringing the kingdom. Now here's what we're going to draw in our panel. Start with two similar objects at either side of your um, of your panel. First of all, on the left side, draw a simple star for Christmas. That represents the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 1 and 2 is the Christmas story. The end of the Gospel is the Easter story, Matthew 26 through 28. So Matthew, much like the first part of the liturgical year, moves from Christmas to Easter. That's the plot of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, For the middle part of the Gospel of Matthew, there is a shadowy figure who is constantly in the background of St. Matthew's thought. Uh, Do you recognize who this figure is? That's Moses, that's right. And he's not just holding the Ten Commandments, he's holding all five of his books, okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay, five tablets there in his arms. And the way I like to draw Moses, as many of you probably know, two beams of light coming from his face, representing his face shining in the presence of God. Now Moses was the great rabbi of Judaism, the great teacher of the Jews, uh, highly revered, obviously. Um, So Moses is in the constant background as we move through Matthew's gospel because Matthew is writing a gospel for the Jews. And one of the major burdens of St. Matthew's gospel is to show that Jesus is a new Moses. Um, And he does this by giving us an account of Jesus' life (coughs) in five sections or five books. So we're sketching in an image of Jesus here. All these elements is important. The crown on our Lord's head represents his royal lineage from David. The halo represents his divinity. He's holding in his hand uh, one sermon because we're talking right here about his first sermon. Um, Matthew is divided into five sections. Uh, Each of the five sections is structured in the same way. You have several chapters about Jesus' miracles and activities, and then you end with a sermon. So Matthew 3 through 7, chapters 3 and 4 are about Jesus' ministry, and then chapters 5 through 7 are what we call the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord's first sermon where he lays out the basic characteristics of the kingdom of God. Now, we're not going to draw our Lord again for each one of the sermons, but we're just going to add a scroll to indicate now here the second sermon. The second sermon of our, of our Lord is the mission sermon. After Matthew 8 and 9, which detail more about our Lord's miracles and other activities, chapter 10 is a sermon of our Lord about missionary work. It's where our Lord sends the 12 out and tells them, don't bring a staff or sandals, etc. Just wander around and eat what's set before you. Uh, If they don't accept your teaching, uh, shake the dust off your feet as you leave leave the town, etc. It's our Lord's mission discourse. The third section of Matthew is Matthew 11 through 13. Again, chapters 11 and 12 are activities of our Lord. Chapter 13 is the mystery sermon. This is where our Lord has seven parables that express how mysterious the kingdom is. It's like a mustard seed. It's like leaven. It's like um, treasure hidden in a field. Uh, It's like um, a field planted with weeds and wheat that grow up together, etc. So the mysterious nature of the kingdom, it's a kind of counterintuitive nature, is stressed in this sermon. The fourth sermon of our Lord is the mercy sermon. Uh, after 
more chapters of Jesus' healings, miracles, and other activities, chapters 14 through 18. In chapter 18, our Lord discourses on mercy. This is where St. Peter asks him, how many times shall we forgive? Up to seven times? No, 70 times seven. This is also um, uh, where Jesus uh, tells some parables of mercy. So he's stressing that the kingdom that he has brought is not a kingdom of judgment. It is a kingdom of mercy and forgiveness. And then the final of the five sermons that our Lord delivers in the Gospel of Matthew uh, takes place again at a mountaintop. See? See the pattern that uh, St. Matthew uses here. He begins on a mountain, the Mount of Beatitudes. He ends on a mountain, the Mount of Olives. And so now the five, uh, the five sermons of our Lord are complete. We have had five books of teaching from Jesus the new Moses. And this is what we call the Mount of Olives sermon. Uh, chapters 19 through 22 talk about Passion Week, basically, our Lord's arrival in Jerusalem <coughs> and his activities there. And then <coughs> chapters 23 through 25 there's a debate about where exactly the sermon begins. But roughly in those chapters, our Lord starts to discourse on the, uh, the end times, the end times. Uh, this is where he says, you know, uh, look at nature. You, when, uh, when, the, when the tree is in, in bloom, you say spring is near. You know, look at the signs of the times, etc. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, flee to the hills, etc. So this is our Lord's uh, often called eschatological discourse, Okay. So you move from Mount of Beatitudes to Mount of Olives. In the mi- middle, you have the Mission, Mystery, and Mercy sermons. Okay, you can also call it the Armageddo sermon. Try to get that M in there so it all works out nicely. So that's basically a picture of the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom has come through Jesus, the son of David, who is our new teacher, our new uh, Moses. All right, moving right along. Um, Matthew down. Now we just have Luke and Acts. And a few others. So, first of all, the Gospel of Luke. Okay, the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke is easier to sketch than the Gospel of Matthew because there's only four sections of Luke. And this is the first section. This is the infant Jesus with the Messianic rattle. And this helps us to recall that uh, the infancy narratives are the first of the four major sections of Luke, Luke 1 through 2, okay? And I picked the theme verse from this section as, God will give him the throne of David. This is from the Annunciation by Gabriel, and I talked about that in my morning talk a little bit, uh, Jesus' royal uh, claims and his royal authority. Okay, so uh, all the, all the uh, joyful mysteries come from those first two chapters, Uh, The second section of St. Luke's Gospel is Luke chapters 3 through 8. This is our Lord's early ministry, uh, where the uh, primary task of St. Luke is to describe our Lord's miracles and his teaching. So look, the teaching is represented by the upraised finger as our Lord makes a point, and the miracles are represented by the multiplication of the loaves and the fish here in these baskets. We give him a crown for his royalty, a halo for his divinity, because just as in Matthew, our Lord is the Son of God and Son of David. This is the early ministry, Luke 3 through 9. This is my beloved Son, is a statement that comes from heaven at the beginning of this section, at the account of the baptism, as well as the end of this section at the transfiguration. The fourth section of Luke is quite unique to Luke's gospel. There's not quite the equivalent of this in the other Uh, three Gospels. And this is what we call the travel narrative. We see our Lord walking here, or kind of moving quickly. And out there in the distance, we're drawing a mountaintop with uh, a building on it. You probably recognize that building. What is that building? Anybody? It's a temple, that's right. That's the temple on Mount Zion, out in the distance, out in Jerusalem. And there's a road, okay? a road leading out to Jerusalem. Simple icon there. We call it the travel narrative because from Luke 10 through 19, Jesus is steadily moving to Jerusalem to face his death. It is the death march of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. 
the theme that we're going to take for this section is, Blessed the King who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the acclamation with which Jesus is greeted when he finally arrives at Jerusalem out there in the distance during what we call the triumphal entry. Uh, The point of this section of Luke is that as Jesus is moving south um, along uh, the road to Jerusalem, he's gathering around himself a core of disciples who will form the nucleus of the church when we get into the book of Acts. So that's the idea there. And then finally, the conclusion of the Gospel of Luke is Luke chapters 20 through 24. This is the Passion Week account of Luke. And uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to portray our Lord holding the Eucharistic elements as he stands on Mount Zion. The reason I do that is because uh, Luke gives us the fullest description of any gospel author uh, about the institution of the Eucharist. Okay? John teaches us the most about Eucharist in John 6, but John actually doesn't tell you about the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. He completely skips that because by the time John wrote, you had already had three accounts of that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that were available to the Christian people. He doesn't want to duplicate that. But Luke gives us the longest account of uh, the institution narrative of the Last Supper and the Eucharist. And the theme verse that I'm going to take out here is Luke 22, 29. I mentioned this in my talk this morning. I covenant to you a kingdom. Jesus says that in the context of the Eucharist. And that's true every time we come to the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the new covenant. Because it's in Luke, actually, that our Lord uh, identifies the Eucharist as the new covenant. He speaks over the cup and says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which means consisting of my blood. And that applies to the body as well. So when we come forward and we take the Eucharist into our bodies... That really is the covenant bond between Jesus and us. And that covenant bond shares with us the kingdom. The kingdom uh, comes to rest on us. We become incorporated into the kingdom of God through the Eucharist. And uh, this is one of the points of uh, the the Gospel of Luke. All right, so that was the Gospel of Luke. We're going to move on to Acts now. And I'm going to do something clever here. Acts begins with the ascension of our Lord after his resurrection, obviously. And so we're going to put a cloud there (laughs) and raise him up there. We're going to send Jesus to this cloud. So uh, Acts begins with the ascension. After Jesus had spoken to them for 40 days about the kingdom of God, Dr. Hahn mentioned this, I mentioned this. This is the, the opening of Acts. Jesus speaking about the kingdom in Jerusalem. The end of Acts is Paul. We recognize Paul there, right? The sword, the letter. So we know that's Paul. But look at this. Look at what Paul has on his leg. He's got a cannonball chained to his leg. That's going to inhibit his mobility. So he's under house arrest in Rome at the end of the book of Acts. But there in house arrest, he's preaching the kingdom of God. So from, uh, from beginning to end of Acts, the theme remains the kingdom of God, but the kingdom grows during this time, right? It starts off in Jerusalem with just a core of the 12 apostles. By the time we get to Acts 28, we have Christian communities all over Asia Minor. We have them down in Ethiopia because of the Ethiopian eunuch. We have them in Rome, in parts of Italy. We have the church spreading to other parts of the empire as well. So the kingdom has grown immensely by the time we get to Acts 28, uh, 31. So it's this growth of the kingdom uh, that, um, uh, that St. Luke wants to highlight here, and this move from Jerusalem to Rome. The move from Jerusalem to Rome is foreshadowed in um, <clears throat> the uh, beginning of Acts, where our Lord says, you're going to be my witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Ends of the earth is an idiom referring to the Gentiles, Rome was the capital of the nations. Rome was the capital of the Gentiles. So you really do move from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, meaning the Gentiles, in the course of the book of uh, Acts. Um, And I have this verse here. That's Acts 1.8. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the end of the earth. And in the center of this panel that we have for Acts, I'm just going to draw that... uh, 
those concentric circles that I drew this morning on the whiteboard that help us to understand that um, not only is this statement in 1.8 uh, a description of the structure of Acts, but it's also a kind of theological map of the kingdom <clears throat> of David, moving from Jerusalem, David's city, to Judea, David's tribe, to Samaria, which was all that was left of David's nation, to the ends of the earth, which is a reference to the Gentiles who were supposed to be David's vassals, according to Psalm 2. And then these are the chapters as well, 1 through 7, and then chapter 8 for those two uh, circles there, and then 9 through 28 is all about uh, bringing the gospel out to the Gentiles. One other thing that I want to draw in this panel, giving myself a little room in the bottom, you can find any convenient place on the panel to draw this, is... uh, The way that Acts is structured around the relationship of two major protagonists. Uh, One is this guy. You know who that is, right? Peter. And then right next to him, his bosom buddy. Yeah, you got it. Some of you are anticipating it already. That's right. There's Paul. Okay, got the keys and the sword. And uh, they're good bros. Yo, man, what's up? So they're hanging out with each other. They get along really well. Uh, Chapters uh, 1 through 12, as Dr. Barber mentioned this morning, are uh, what I like to call the Peter Channel. It's all Peter all the time, except for that cameo by Paul in Acts 9. And then uh, Acts uh, 13 through 28 are all Paul all the time, except for a cameo by Peter in Acts chapter 15. So there's a a nice kind of parallelism between the sections of Acts that focus on St. Peter, the section of Acts that focus on St. Paul. Uh, The book roughly divides in half around that. And then I'm just going to pop up here uh, the different things that these two apostles do uh, similarly in the book of Acts. They both preach the kingdom in the same way. You can compare uh, Peter's sermon in Acts 2 with with, with Paul's sermon in Acts 13, and see that they have virtually the same themes and sometimes refer to the same scriptures. They both defeat a sorcerer, uh, Simon Magus and Elimas, uh, respectively. They both heal at a distance, Peter by his shadow, Paul by his handkerchief. They both raise the dead. Um, St. Peter raises Tabitha. Uh, St. Paul raises Eutychus. Of course, Paul killed Eutychus first with his deadly long homily, literally, a six-hour homily that went through the night, and the poor guy fell asleep in the window, fell down dead, and, uh, and Paul had to raise him. Well, you know, if you're going to preach six-hour homilies, you better be able to raise the dead, because uh, that's going to be necessary, and you're not going to last long in that parish, Father, so that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> they both escaped from prison. Uh, uh, St. Paul in uh, Acts 12 And uh, I'm sorry, St. Peter in Acts 12 and uh, St. Paul in Acts uh, 16, uh, both in a similar manner. Okay, so that is the book of Acts. Those are our images to remember the key ideas and the key structures of that book. Let's move on to St. Paul now. St. Paul is not talking about the growth of the kingdom in the way that St. Luke was, but St. Paul is going to teach us about living in the kingdom. Now, you don't have to write this part down. First, we're going to do a little mnemonic so that we can learn to memorize the letters of St. Paul. Okay, the 14 letters of St. Paul are the hardest part of memorizing the order of the books of uh, the New Testament because it's always so difficult to remember if Smyrnaeans comes before Hezekians or not. But this will help you out. We know they go Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, uh, Philemon, and then finally Hebrews, which is disputed uh, in terms of its authorship, but is associated with St. Paul. Okay, so Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. This is the order. Now, how do we remember this? Well, the first three books... You remember with the acronym Roman Catholic Church. Easy enough, okay? Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, okay? Uh, That's easy to remember. Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is the world's largest organization. 
Next to the Roman Catholic Church, the next largest organization in the world is the General Electric Power Company. And that gives you Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, right? So you just got to remember the two biggest human organizations. Then you have five T's all in a row, and they're all alphabetical. Isn't that convenient? Okay. So all the T books of Paul's letters uh, all fall alphabetical in a row, first, second Thessalonians, first, second Timothy, and then T- Titus. Well, if you're from the South, you know all these T's need a lemon. Philemon. There you go. But not everybody likes tea, so if you don't like tea, he brews you a coffee. Yeah. Yeah, ha, 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 ha. Okay? So these are the 14 letters of St. Paul, a little mnemonic device uh, to help us remember them. Now, <clears throat> we can't go through all the letters of St. Paul uh, today, so we're going to focus on the longest and the most important, which is uh, Romans. Um, and we're going to do four uh, like little cartoon squares uh, for the book of Romans. I think your panel for St. Paul is divided into four, if I recall, on your handout. So uh, each, uh, each little uh, cartoon square is going to be a slide that I'm going to do. So in your first slide, or your first uh, uh, square for St. Paul, we're going to do two, two figures. So try to fit these two figures in. One figure is going to be a Jew, And uh, all I could figure out to do was to give him an Israeli flag. And uh, this other figure that we've got here, uh, we're going to draw him next to the Jewish man, and he's going to be a Greek. And all I could figure out to do for him was uh, make a Greek flag. So uh, we go like so. Just has to be approximate, folks. Just sketching as you can, okay? Uh, And this is trying to represent... This theme verse from the first part of Romans, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who has faith, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The major burden of the epistle to the Romans is St. Paul trying to demonstrate that there are not two paths to salvation, Moses for the Jews and Jesus for the Gentiles. To this day, that view, that two paths to salvation view, is often defended by theologians, even by theologians in the church, even though the whole letter to uh, the Romans is explicitly aimed to debunk that view. That's the way it goes. Um, Magisterial teaching does not put an end to debate in the church. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, as uh, docile followers of the apostles, we should accept St. Paul's teaching that the gospel unites Jew and Greek. And by Greek, St. Paul really means the Gentiles. He means the Greek-speaking populace of the world, because Greek was, like like English is today, it was the universal language. Okay, so the gospel is what joins Jew and Greek into one body that together is saved, all right? Jews and Gentiles, in other words, are united by the gospel and by it brought into salvation. This is a major point in the book of Romans, all right? So that's our first uh, uh, square for the book of Romans. We're going to move on now. Uh, to the next square. The next square is where St. Paul articulates what the problem is. You see, we talk about the good news, but before you understand how great the good news is, you have to understand the bad news. And so in Romans 1 and 2, uh, St. Paul articulates what the bad news is. I mean, what, what, did, what does the gospel save us from? And St. Paul says that the, the, the problem for which the gospel is the answer is that mankind, as individuals as well as societies, descends from peace with God to misery without God. And in a, in a famous passage in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, which I highly recommend that you re- re- review on your own when you have opportunity, St. Paul describes how humanity begins by rejecting God and worshiping the creation, which is idolatry. Since that doesn't satisfy the human heart, uh, humanity begins to experiment with sexual immorality because we want the love of a person. Not finding the love of another person in idolatry, we try to find the love from another person in human relationships, especially through sexual expression. Um, That doesn't satisfy We think then that the answer is to experiment with wilder and more exotic forms of 
sexuality, which are contrary to the ways that our bodies are designed, etc. And so we get into unnatural immorality. Meanwhile, while society is doing all this unnatural immorality, nobody is raising Johnny. So Johnny is growing up without two parents in a home. Johnny is growing up not being able to read and write or know right and wrong. And so you get generations coming up in society who lead to social chaos, who are undisciplined, intemperate, lack fortitude, lack prudence, etc. And and society uh, eventually collapses. And so these are the four stages of the degradation of humanity, according to St. Paul. You see this pattern uh, in individuals, okay? Individuals can do this, leave the faith, get into worshiping something else like money or uh, power or fame, and then begin these kinds of experimentation until their lives are a wreck. You also see this happening in societies as a whole. So that's the problem. Now, what's the answer to this sad story? Moving on now to our third square. Well, first of all, what the answer isn't. Okay, the answer is not uh, this individual. We're going to sketch in here. The answer is not Moses. As much as we like Moses, you recognize the icon of Moses there, okay? Uh, He gave us the Ten Commandments and he gave us a lot of other laws. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are coming in there. Those are all added after the Ten Commandments are broken. Okay, Moses is not going to save us. St. Paul says, no one will be justified by works of the law, Romans 3.20. Now, in ancient Judaism, works of the law uh, was a phrase that referred to the ritual requirements of the Mosaic Covenant. So the only place that this phrase, works of the law, appears outside of St. Paul is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in a document that's about things like treating uh, uh, the hides of dead animals and what kind of grain you can offer at the temple and uh, the purity of streams of liquid from one container into another and on and on, like really esoteric, really technical stuff about keeping ritual cleanliness. So, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, all those little technical things are called works of the law, okay? They're different from works of mercy or from good works, which is a different kind of concept, okay? The Jews held that all humanity, and they hold, that all humanity is obliged to do good works because all humanity falls under the Noahic covenant. And the Noahic covenant is basically natural law. And uh, you have to obey the natural law and we have to do good works. But only Jews were required to do the works of the Torah, okay, which is these special additional requirements of ritual cleanliness, uh, et cetera, uh, that were part of the law of Moses. St. Paul says that's not the answer. No one's going to be justified by works of the law. By justified, St. Paul means uh, like transformed, like made just, like made into a righteous person. Well, what is going to make us into a righteous person? That is going to be the cross. The cross of Jesus has power. Because out of the sacred heart of Jesus at the cross flows that river of blood and water, which is really the sign of the Holy Spirit's love. Okay, <coughs> The power of the Holy Spirit comes forth from the sacrifice of Christ. <coughs> and then that power of the Holy Spirit is received by us Okay, see this little icon here. This is us down below. Look at that long outstretched hand. Okay, that's the hand of faith. Okay, faith is the means by which we reach out to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit flows from Jesus' heart into our hearts. Okay, and this gives us power. See, the problem is that St. Paul identifies in the book of Romans is not that we don't know what's right, but we lack the power to do what's right. And Moses doesn't give us that power. The one who gives us that power is Jesus Christ, who gives us the Holy Spirit. So in Romans 5, St. Paul famously says, we are justified by faith. That's the hand that reaches out to receive grace from God because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Okay? The gift of divine love through the Holy Spirit enables you to love in a way that you were not able to before. 
Okay, it enables you to fulfill the, the law of God, which consists of love of God and love of neighbor. You can actually fulfill that by the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we receive in the sacrament. So I'll leave that up for just a second, okay? Not Moses, but Jesus. That's the answer to the problem. All right, so what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is we have a choice. This is every man here, and every man has a question mark because every man has to make a decision. Which way am I going to go? I can follow the Spirit, which I can receive by faith, through Christ, or I can follow the flesh, which is a reference to um, uh, concupiscence, the desires of our body and the, and the desires of our mind. Now, if we follow the flesh, that's going to lead to death. Okay? But if we follow the life of the Spirit, that's going to lead to eternal life. And as a symbol of eternal life, I like to use this uh, image of the tree of life that I've used in other presentations and in my books, etc. So the, the, the theme idea here is if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, that's concupiscence, you will live, Romans 8, 13. Okay? So this is not salvation by faith alone. This is salvation by the Holy Spirit, provided we allow the Spirit to put to death our sinful desires and lead us on the path of holiness uh, towards uh, eternal life. That's the message of Romans. Okay? Sadly, Luther read the book of Romans and got something like salvation by faith alone out of it, uh, which was kind of an imbalanced reading of this book. Uh, Romans is actually very Roman Catholic, and uh, Roman Catholic Christians should not be afraid of the book. All right, let's move on now. Gospel of John. I've got to finish in about 10 minutes here. So the Gospel of John, we're going to do a little differently. There are seven elements to the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John, first of all, if, um, if uh, Paul was about uh, living in the kingdom, and how we live in the kingdom, by following the Spirit, namely, John is about the perfection of the kingdom. In his Gospel, he's going to talk about, he's going to describe the perfection of the Christian life through participation in the sacraments. And in, in the book of Revelation, he's going to describe the perfection of the church at the end of time. Uh, but both the gospel and uh, Revelation are really, about, really uh, about perfection, about coming to fullness or completion. And um, in this square here, I'm going to list the seven main elements of the gospel of John that structure this gospel. And I'm going to list them top down. But your orientation on your paper is a longer from left to right. So you may want to do these in order from one through seven left to right while I'm doing them top down, okay, because of the dimensions of my screen. So the first element of the Gospel of John that we want to talk about is the miracle of the water to wine at Cana, okay? This is the first sign that our Lord performs in the Gospel of John. Now, John consistently calls the miracles of our Lord in his gospel, signs. And that's for a reason. It's because they are pointers. They point to something. In particular, they point to Jesus' identity. That's one thing they point to. But they also point to the sacraments. And a, a wonderful thing about the Gospel of John that you discover upon further study and reading it in light of uh, the Christian tradition is that John has told the stories of Jesus' major signs in such a way that you can see a link to the sacraments of the church. And the point that John is making is that the power of Jesus unleashed in the signs of his ministry is still available to us as Christians through the sacraments that the church continues to celebrate. So we, uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to link up the seven signs or the seven miracle accounts that form the backbone of the Gospel of John and we're going to link each one with at least one sacrament. So in the transformation of the water to wine at Cana in John chapter 2, Jesus shows himself to be the great bridegroom. Remember when the water is taken from the jugs and it's brought to the, uh, the master ceremonies? He tastes it, and who does he call? He calls the bridegroom. That's right, because just as in our culture... We have certain roles in a wedding, like the father of the bride pays for the wedding, 
the father of the groom pays for the rehearsal dinner, and, and there's other duties for the maid of honor and uh, the best man, etc. So in those ancient times, it was the duty of the bridegroom to provide the wedding, excuse me, to provide the wine for the wedding ceremony. So when the master of ceremonies tastes this great wine, he assumes that the bridegroom has provided it. Well, in a spiritual sense, the bridegroom has, because the true bridegroom at the wedding at Cana is Jesus. This is why he'll be uh, identified as the bridegroom in the next chapter in John 3, explicitly by John the Baptist, who talks about, you know, the, he who is the groom has the bride, the, the groomsman hears the voice and rejoices, etc., Okay, so Jesus announces himself as the spiritual spouse who has come to woo humanity to himself. And there are these images of the, of the bridegroom king from the Old Testament as well that we could talk about in Hosea and uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, etc., and some of the Psalms uh, that, uh, that Jesus is fulfilling by doing this. But this points to, obviously, the sacrament of matrimony. Within matrimony, uh, the spouses are supposed to be Jesus to each other. The point in marriage is to mediate Jesus' love to your spouse. I am supposed to be Jesus to Dawn, my wife. Dawn is supposed to be Jesus to me. And uh, through the sacrament of matrimony, we experience the love of Jesus through each other. So um, that's the first sign in the uh, Gospel of John. The second sign in the Gospel of John is a couple chapters later in John chapter 4. This is the healing of the official's son. You remember the story. Um, this official comes to Jesus and he says, I've got this son and he's near death. Can you please come and save him? And Jesus says, well, just go your way and your son will be well. So the official goes back. Um, when he gets home, he finds out that his son has been healed. He asks the servants, when did he get better? They say at such and such a time on the other day. And the official realizes that's exactly when Jesus said, go your way and your son will be well. So what does Jesus do here? Someone is at the point of death, and at the point of death, Jesus unleashes healing power to save that person. Do we have a sacrament for people at the point of death that unleashes power from Jesus to affect salvation for them? <laughs> Why, yes, we do. Imagine that. We call it extreme unction or last rites, and we'll just make a flask of oil to the side to represent that, okay? So we can make a kind of a link there. The next uh, sign that Jesus performs in this gospel is the healing of the paralytic at Bethesda. So you have this man laying on a pallet next to the healing water. When the angel comes down and stirs the water, everybody's supposed to jump in, and the first one in gets healed. He's been lying there 38 years. He's never been able to be first because he's paralyzed or whatever. He can't crawl in fast enough. Jesus comes by. Do you want to be healed? Yes, of course, blah, 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 blah. So Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. The man gets up, takes his pallet, walks away without ever getting into the water. Later, Jesus finds him and says, look, go and sin no more that nothing worse may befall you. So we realize that there was actually also a forgiveness of sin that was part of this healing that this man underwent. Now, hmm, do we have a sacrament that involves healing and forgiveness of sin without having to go into the water? <laughs> we do. And it's called reconciliation. And a traditional sign is the, uh, the keys of the kingdom, where uh, the priest decides whether to retain or forgive, as according to uh, John 20. Uh, 23 and 24, the breathing on the disciples and giving them the power to forgive or retain sin. Okay, so the healing of the paralytic at Bethesda is like, in certain ways, the sacrament of reconciliation. Uh, the next sign in the Gospel of John is our Lord's feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. No brainer! Uh, we all know those five weeks in the summer where Father Joe has to preach on the Eucharist every week because it's another five verses from John 6 in the lectionary, week after week. And uh, all our poor pastors run out of all of their Eucharistic sermons when that part of the lectionary rolls around. So uh, the feeding of the 5,000, definitely Eucharistic teaching. Uh, the next sign in the Gospel of John is the healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9. Let's think about that story. You have the man born blind. Jesus comes, sees him, spits on the ground, makes clay from the spittle, 
that's a recapitulation of how the Jews regarded the, uh, the uh, creation of the first man. They, they, they imagined God the Father spitting on the ground to make clay from the earth to create Adam. So when Jesus uh, recapitulates those acts, it's calling to mind the creation of the first man. He takes that clay, he puts it on the eyes of the blind man, tells the blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Um, there's a, a lot of symbolism in that as well, because the pool of Siloam is associated with Jesus himself in the Gospel of John. So the man goes and he washes in the pool of Siloam, comes up and he's enlightened. Okay, He can see, he comes back seeing, and then he begins to give testimony about Jesus. So the man is born in darkness, um, uh, Jesus ministers to him, washes him, he becomes enlightened, uh, he can see. Uh, do we have a sacrament where people are born in, say, the darkness of original sin, and then they go through a washing ritual, which is termed enlightenment, and thereafter they're gifted with spiritual sight? Of course we do, and it's a sacrament of baptism. So John chapter 9 is really a catechesis on the sacrament of baptism, and so it was used in the early church. We have um, uh, catechetical sermons from church fathers that are based on John 9 and kind of drawing out all the connections with baptism in that miracle. The sixth, um, the sixth uh, sign in the Gospel of John is the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Um, now, we could connect this uh, sign with different sacraments. In a sense, baptism is a resurrection, so we could connect it with that. We could connect it with reconciliation because when we confess our sins, that's also a spiritual resurrection. But we have not had a uh, connection with confirmation yet, so we're going to work with that connection here. And the connection is made in this way. If you read carefully about the raising of Lazarus, you find in the end of chapter 11 into chapter 12 of John that Lazarus gives such powerful testimony to Jesus that the Jewish council gathers together and plots to kill Lazarus to suppress his testimony. Darn guy won't stay dead. Got to kill him again. Okay. Because he's witnessing to this rabbi Jesus. So what do we see about Lazarus? Lazarus, after his resurrection, was a powerful witness even in the face of persecution, even in the face of death. And typically, when we do confirmation prep, we talk about how this is a strengthening sacrament that gives you the power to witness even in the face of persecution. So we're going to draw that connection uh, with uh, the, the healing of Lazarus. And then the final sign in the Gospel of John is the resurrection of our Lord himself. And all of the sacraments flow from the resurrection of Christ. We could talk about baptism you know, being an, uh, an experience of death on the cross and resurrection on Easter uh, morning. We could talk about how uh, the, the resurrection is the raised body of Jesus that we partake of in the Eucharist. Uh, we could connect, yes, indeed, all of them. But we have not made a connection with holy orders yet. So we're going to draw a stole. And we're going to point out that one of the first things our Lord does after his resurrection is go to his apostles and uh, tell them, uh, I, I breathe the Spirit on you whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. And in that one act, that gift of the Holy Spirit, he authorizes the apostles as the priests of the new covenant. He really creates two sacraments there. He creates the sacrament of holy orders, and he creates the sacrament of reconciliation there in Luke uh, excuse me, in uh, John 20, verses uh, around about 22 through 24, right in there. Okay, so that is uh, a basic uh, structure of the seven signs of the Gospel of John and how they connect to the sacraments. I truly believe that was John's intention to show the uh, early Christians that the power of Jesus was still available to them. The Gospel was not something relegated to the past. Uh, what is the theme verse for the Gospel of John? I'm going to use John 3, verse 5. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water and Spirit is referring to baptism, but I think we can extend that to cover all the sacraments. The basic idea is, unless you experience the sacraments, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. The sacraments are the entryway into the kingdom. All right, let's move on to the book of Revelation. 
Uh, we have uh, a couple squares for Revelation, and then we have a big uh, panel for the finale. In the first square for the book of Revelation, you can draw seven churches if you want to take the time, or you can just draw one church and write the number seven by it, uh, which I might recommend. Uh, but uh, here I'm going to bring up seven churches because the book of Revelation, this book of the last uh, times, begins with uh, seven letters dictated by Jesus to the seven main churches of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, which was the heartland of Christianity in the first century. First, Jesus writes to the loveless church of Ephesus, then to the persecuted church of Smyrna, the self-indulgent church of Pergamon, uh, the immoral church of Thyatira, the spiritually dead church of Sardis, the powerless church of Philadelphia, and lastly, the lukewarm church of Laodicea, which is probably the best known of the seven. All right, These uh, letters uh, of Jesus to the seven churches of Asia Minor have perennial relevance to the church in every age. At every time in church history, we can read these seven letters and see uh, which of these uh, seven churches are local churches like, whether we're applying it to the diocese, the local diocese of Steubenville, for example, or or my home parish, St. Peter's. We can read these letters and say, okay, does anything of what Jesus is saying apply to the parish of St. Peter's or the Diocese of Steubenville or the Diocese of uh, uh, Houston Galveston or whatever uh, part of the church you might be at? And the idea is, if the shoe fits, wear it, okay? If what Jesus is saying to one of these churches applies to your local church, take his advice and correct uh, your misdemeanors. Um, And so they are perpetually relevant. Okay, in our next square... Um, let's see. Yeah, I think we've got four squares, right? And then we've got a big one below. Okay, so we've done the seven churches. Now, uh, we're going to do three sets of seven in the next three squares. Uh, In the first square, we're going to do seven uh, scrolls with seals on them. So I'm going to drop down seven scrolls, okay? And this is because in the next section of the book of Revelation, chapter six and seven, you see a heavenly liturgy going on where heavenly heavenly worshipers break seals, open scrolls, and plagues fall on earth. And at the end of that process, uh, there's a cry in heaven, salvation belongs to our God. Okay, it sounds like triumph, but we don't go right into the final piece yet. Instead, we have the blowing of seven trumpets. And in Revelation 8 through 10, Seven trumpets are blown, one after another. This, again, is part of the heavenly liturgy because the blowing of trumpets was part of ancient worship. And at the end of the blowing of the seven trumpets, a cry rings out in heaven, the kingdom has become the kingdom of our Lord. You think, okay, great, it's over. Now everything's final. Jesus is king. We're going to end history and we're going to end the book. But no, we still have a set of sevens to go. We haven't poured out the seven bowls yet. So now we bring in the seven bowls in Revelation 15 through 19. One bowl after another is outpoured, and when each bowl is poured out, a plague falls on the earth. And when the seven bowls are poured out, we hear the cry in heaven in Revelation 16, it is finished, okay? And, uh, but this time, we really are moving into uh, the final age because uh, things are going to wrap up after the pouring out of that last bowl. Now, um, many commentators read the book of Revelation with these three sets of seven representing historical events that are all going to fall in sequence, so a sequence of 21 historical events near the end of time. I'm not convinced of that. I think that we might be hearing in stereo here, okay, that these three sets of seven, each ending with this declaration of victory, really are three different perspectives on the same sequence of plagues that's going to end the world, okay? And in a different sense, also ended the city of Jerusalem back in AD 70. We have precedent for this because in the scriptures, if you go back to the book of Genesis, remember there were dreams in Genesis? Pharaoh had a dream, remember this? 
And he dreamed first of, um, I forget if it was the cows or the ears of corn first, but he, he dreamt of uh, five healthy cows coming out of the Nile, and, I'm sorry, seven healthy cows coming out of the Nile, uh, which were eaten up by seven scrawny cows that came out of the Nile. And again, he has a dream, and there's seven full ears of grain that are consumed by seven scrawny ears of grain that come after. Then Joseph is brought in to interpret the, the dream for Pharaoh, and Joseph says, the two dreams are one and the same. You're going to have seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. The reason why you dreamed it twice in two different ways is because it's going to happen soon, right? Now look at the parallels. Both visions, both involving sets of seven, both multiple times. This is not just twice, this is three times, which would be very soon. And isn't that what it said at the beginning of the book? This is going to happen very soon, right? So I think this is three parallel accounts of, um, of what's going to happen, but also what, uh, what did happen. Because I think we have to read the book of Revelation on two levels. On one level, and this is now the last panel on your, on your paper, and this is a big one, and we're going to draw here the Hora Babylon, okay, the harlot woman from Revelation 19. She's all overdressed here. Too much jewelry. Okay, not just flashy, but trashy. And, uh, and she's seated on this beast, okay? This seven-headed beast. Yeah, and I know, it's going to take you a long time to draw it. Don't worry about that. Just, you know, scribble some kind of beast-looking thing uh, under the uh, harlot woman. So here's this harlot woman seated on the beast in Revelation 19. Now, who is she? The typical interpretation is that she's the city of Rome, okay? And the reason for that is because she's seated on these, this seven-headed beast, and Revelation 19 says the seven heads are seven hills, and everybody knows that Rome was built on seven hills. However, notice this, the, the seven heads are on the beast, they're not on the woman, okay? The woman is supported by the beast. So I think that the woman represents Jerusalem, the earthly city of Jerusalem, because the leaders of Jerusalem were quite literally supported by Rome. The Herods, for example, the Herodian dynasty was put in power by Rome and kept in power by Roman legions. So were the Sadducees who ran the Sanhedrin. And the other wealthy people of Rome were pro- excuse me, of Jerusalem were propped up by Roman authority. What you see happen in the book of Revelation is toward the end of Revelation 19, the beast turns on the woman and destroys her and burns her with fire. And that's exactly what happened between uh, A.D. 66 to A.D. 70, where there was a falling out between uh, the city of Jerusalem and Rome, and Rome came in and destroyed and burned up the harlot woman. Why is she a harlot woman? Because she was in bed with the world system. Uh, Jerusalem at the time of our Lord was the wealthiest city of the ancient world, wealthier than Rome itself, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that, and that's also confirmed uh, by other uh, geographers uh, of the time period. Um, so much silver in Jerusalem at this time period that pots that are buried in that archaeological layer have a spike in silver content just from all the money that's lying around in the ground uh, from the layer representing the first century. So Rome, uh, Jerusalem was this city of trade that was making, uh, making money off of the whole earth, That's reflected in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 18, where the merchants of the earth mourn the death of the harlot woman, which took place in Revelation chapter 17. So I think this refers to the earthly city of Jerusalem. She is destroyed, but if Jerusalem is destroyed, what is the new Jerusalem going to be? Well, we get a new Jerusalem at the end of the book of Revelation. We get the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven from God, dressed like a bride, The bridal attire tips us off that this is representing the church because from the book of Ephesians, we know that the church is the bride of Christ. And the lamb that is the groom for the bride uh, in the New Jerusalem, that is obviously Jesus. And so we get a picture of the church being presented to Jesus as bride in Revelation 20 through 22. And uh, they take up abode together on the New Jerusalem The new Jerusalem has the elements of Eden, the river of life, the tree of life that go back to the Garden of Eden. So it's not only the new Jerusalem, but it's also the new Eden. Uh, It's the church. It's also the temple of God. You might say, 
Why, by the way, is the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, coming out of heaven for the Lamb? Why is it uh, given the dimensions of a perfect cube in uh, Revelation chapters 21 and 22? The imagery of the cube harks back to the Holy of Holies, okay? The Holy of Holies was the only perfectly cubical thing that we find in Scripture up to this point, okay? The Holy of Holies was the residing place of the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant. But now, where does the Holy Spirit reside? In each one of us, right? Because of the gift of the Spirit through baptism, And because we are living stones, Ephesians chapter 2, building up the temple of God in the new covenant, the temple of God, which is the church composed of living stones, each of which has the Holy Spirit, is one big holy of holies. Make sense? Okay. All of us here, we're all the holy of holies. Okay. So this is the meaning of this symbolism. It's the church being presented to, to Jesus. It's the church being presented to Jesus at the end of time, the church triumphant. But it's also the church being presented to Jesus after the destruction of Jerusalem when the church takes over as the new temple, okay? Because there is no competing temple after AD 70. There is no other place to worship the God of Israel other than the temple of living stones, which is made up of the believers of the church, okay? So you got this transferal. And that is, uh, so you got to read Revelation on two levels. It refers to the events of AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem and the church age, but it also refers to the end of times where this is going to be recapitulated on a larger uh, scale. All right, folks, Uh, they shall reign forever and ever. There's our kingdom theme. This is what we're looking forward to. And we have just gotten through the New Testament in an hour and 15 minutes. So, woohoo! All right. Sorry I went a little over, but I'm trying to go a little bit more in depth uh, with everyone. This uh, calls to mind our four authors who give us 90% of the New Testament. This is based on my book, New Testament Basics for Catholics, available from Ave Maria Press. So thank you very much, and uh, I've used up all our time, so everybody's good to go. And uh, thank you for your attentiveness.